good evening and it's a joy to be with you all again I'm just trying to fix this okay yeah it's a real joy to be with you and to be able to share the Word of God and maybe especially tonight what I'm talking about last week and this week it is at the very foundation of our Christian living and uh, another way of saying it's the portal of our Christian experience we, we go through this and this is where we live um, by the very nature of, of what we're talking about tonight I, I say this is where we live because you, you're never far from doing this and so I want every one of us, even though uh, some of you I know, you could say that you know what I'm talking about very well. Well, it won't do any harm to sit back and let the Holy Spirit apply this to us in a fresh new way. The text is from Ephesians in chapter 4 and in verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. They are incredible words. I, I wonder why they're not preached on almost every week because have we even really heard them? Uh, and I'm not going to read them all again, though I feel like it. But just that last phrase of chapter 4, forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. I mean, put that on your refrigerator and, and let it sink in. And therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love just as Christ loved you. Well, the text from last week, love one another as I have loved you. I, I suppose what I'm saying is that we must get serious with the scripture. This is the gospel. I am just reading to you the gospel, the details of the gospel. And yet for so many believers, they hardly know such scriptures are in the Bible. Now what is happening here? What is Paul doing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he's addressing you and I, believers, and saying, let bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you and, and instead be kind and so on. Well, what's he doing? The word that fills the idea of, of this throughout the New Testament and is actually mentioned um, in Romans in chapter 12 as well as in Titus the word is renewal uh, the one in Romans 12 says be transformed by the renewal of your minds that's what Paul is doing here he is under the guidance of the Holy Spirit leading us in the renewal of our minds now the word renewal um, maybe it's a little vague in some people's mind I, I find a, a better way maybe to say what it means is renovation we, we know what renovation is the, the time when you go into your old kitchen which no longer functions as uh, you would like it to function and so you tear out what's there you tear out the, the cooker and the dishwasher and the cabinets and the countertop and you put in something new that that is more fitting to you who are the dweller in the house that's this word renewal 
it is describing the Holy Spirit who is your resident teacher. He's your resident guide through life. He is the one who is actively conforming us to the image of Christ. And he, since you have believed, is now in the process of tearing out the old cabinet, you see. He's tearing out that cooker that hardly works uh, and, and certainly is not fitting for the new life that you are. He's tearing out the countertops that bear all the stains and marks of an old life. And he's putting in a new life, a new behavior. You are the new creation. You are. Christ is your life. Now that has got to be brought down into your thoughts, your worldviews, how you look at life, how you understand life, brought down to your belief systems upon which your actions and behaviors are based. It's a process, you see, where old stuff is taken out, removed, and that's what he's saying. He says, put it away, put it away. And in a moment I'll tell you what that, that word means. It's a strong word. The renewal process, this renovating process that's taking place in you right now. I trust it happens quite a bit on Tuesday nights and as you meditate on through the week. Where, where what you once believed, you believe no more. What once held you as a behavior holds you no more. And your behaviors are changing. They are being conformed to the mind of Christ and the life of Christ by the Holy Spirit from within. And this renewal process is spoken of in Philippians chapter 2. You could read the first 13 verses if you have the time, not now. But it's describing this, that we, we would have the very mind of Christ. And so it comes in verses 12 and 13, where it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so he's commanding you, commanding me, work out your own salvation. Work out. Um, how can... I tell you what that means in the original language. The words work out mean bring to harvest. That is, the farmer that puts the seeds in the ground then spends the time of weeding and, and making sure it's watered and, and as it grows, that process uh, of growth is called in the Greek language working it out. And so he is saying this deposit of grace, this deposit of life in Christ has been placed in you. Now bring it to harvest. Bring it to harvest. There's a lot of weeds here that are just old remembrances from the past. Get rid of them. They don't belong to you anymore. That's not you. Get rid of them. Let your life be watered. Let the Holy Spirit water your life. And so you will bring to harvest this seed within you. But as he's commanding you to an obedience of faith, he goes right on. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And that is a very old expression, which means in that certain awe of what we're talking about. And we should have that awe tonight. We're speaking of just you and I, ordinary people living on this planet, and yet we're, we're talking about Christ himself living in us, of the Holy Spirit bringing that into concrete flesh-blood behavior in our lives. Yes, you do that with, with a certain awe, with, with a certain sense of the enormity of it. So work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But then he goes on, you see, and says, for, that is, you can do that. Why? Because it is God, God the Holy Spirit, who is at work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And the word work there means the divine energy in operation. It is divine love energy 
the word in the Greek is energia, energy, and, and God's at work in you. Hear me, as you're looking at me tonight, hear me. God is at work in you to will. He, he's putting in you the, the very will of God, the very pleasure and delight of God to bring you to be a divine lover in Christ and Christ in you. That, that's, that's how this works. This, this renewal is going on. But first, he talks about all the weeds that need to be put away. And I think it would be good to know because uh, through lack of teaching, many believers can hardly identify a weed in their life. And the first one that heads the list is bitterness. What is bitterness? Bitterness is a condition of spirit. It's a condition that has taken root. And I hear that word. It takes root. When someone has done us wrong, and that might be a very great wrong, that they have done to us, a very great evil, a great pain, or it may be something so small, but because of the way we were, we took it badly, and we've never forgiven them, and so now we cling to it. Instead of forgiving, we cling to the hurt. We cling to the hurt determined that in some way that a bitter person could never explain to you, because the truth is there, there is no explanation, but the bitter person really believes that if they cling to this hurt and nurse it and water it and let it grow, then somehow the person who hurt them will pay for what they did, be punished for what they did. And so, people nurture the hurt. And this is linked to, to another word that is in the scripture, and we often talk about, and that is judgment. You know, Matthew 7 says, Judge not that you be not judged. What is judgment? Judgment, hear me again carefully, judgment is when we put a person, that person who hurt us, that person who did something, who betrayed us, abused us, but we, we put them in a freeze frame. You know what I mean? Um, well, if you ever watch sports, uh, that happens quite a bit. That, like, like in the Olympics, as, as the skier is flying through the air, and, and then he's flipping over, you know? And then they, they freeze frame it, and, and, and everything stops. There he is hanging in the air on his skis, freeze framed. Well, bitterness is like that, that somebody said something, somebody did something, and we freeze frame them. That's them. That's it. That's them. As if there was nothing before, and there's certainly nothing after. They're going nowhere. They're just caught. And it may be 20 years ago, but when we think of them, talk about them, that's them. Caught in the action. Caught in the word of their hurting us. Caught in the behavior of their abuse or whatever it was. But in our minds, that's them. We have caught them and given them that's their identity. You see, we put them in that box and we won't let them out. That's them. We imprison them in whatever they did or whatever they said. And we'll never allow the thought to enter that they ever became anything else. The elder brother in the parable that Jesus spoke of the son, prodigal son returning. The father said, notice this carefully, you were lost. And he also said, you were dead. That was the truth. And, and, and forgiveness has nothing to do with lying. That's the truth. But it doesn't make it 
all the truth. He says, you were lost, you are found. You were dead, you are alive. You are my son. The elder brother actually gave definition to the lost and the dead. And he begins to give a long resume of everything that the son had done in the far country, lurid details. And as far as that elder brother was concerned, the son couldn't ever get out of that. That was him. It didn't matter if he came home. It didn't matter what his father said. It didn't matter. That's who his kid brother was. Would always be. Do you understand? He'd freeze-framed him. He'd given him an identity that could never change. You see, there's a difference with di discernment. In fact, it's interesting when Paul prays for people's love to increase, he prayed they'll have discernment too, because discernment means I, I, I'm not blind stupid. I, yeah, I, I biblically, I, I not only can, but I must say when something is wrong, of course, that, that's not a judgment, that, that is that with two eyes in my head and, and, and common decency sometimes, but certainly the Holy Spirit, I can see what that person is doing is wrong. That's not judgment. That, that's discernment because I'm saying that their behavior is wrong, but I'm not making it their identity. I'm not putting them in a box. I'm leaving the end open for whatever God is doing in them. Anyway, and I, I got off on that. The, the, the fact is that bitterness is the people who freeze frame. That bitterness is the people who live with boxes in their life. Or you might say prison cells where they keep people. I say it can last for years. And as long as bitterness is held, its roots grow. And the Hebrews speaks about it, talks about it, the, the root of bitterness. It can go back to childhood, painful events of childhood. And, and, and we never let them go. And so by the time we're advanced in age, the, the rootage of that pain and hurt has gone all through our system. Um, all forms of abuse, whether in childhood or throughout our uh, adult years, or maybe business partner who cheated on you, betrayed you, your ex-spouse in a divorce, or what a lot of us, and I say that very frankly, the fact that you're, you're listening to me tonight, um, would suggest, and this is a hard thing to say, but, but so many persons are hungry and thirsty after truth because they have been deeply disappointed with organized church and organized denominations. And maybe it's worse than disappointment. Maybe you've been abused by organized church, abused with cruel legalism. And it so hurts you, a root of bitterness. You, you, you now despise the organized church. And, and, and you want nothing to do with anything that remotely looks like it. And, and it spilled over what happened to you in that one place among that certain company of people. has spilled over to how you look at all organized churches and denominations and sometimes even Christians all those things they all have within them the seeds of bitterness that send down roots that actually destroy us what well, what is bitterness how does it work bitterness is that we continually return to the event that in our mind we go back to it and we remember what was said. And in mental movies, we can see the replay 
of what was happening and we are the tragic star of the movie. Well, what are we doing? Let me give you a very horrible illustration. Have you ever had a nasty cut on your person and now it's, it's, it's got the possibility of healing now and there's a, a scab on it? Well, if you go and you pull off that scab and we're back to square one, the blood starts to run again, you've exposed it to all the bacteria and what if every time it could begin to heal you pull off the scab? Well, that's something like what bitterness is, that we're ever returning to the event to try and revive the feelings, to try and revive the horror the pain and the hurt and we pull off the scab and we let the blood start to run again. So whenever the person's name, that person who hurt you, whenever their name comes up, you find rage rising up within you. Whenever something happens that's remotely the same as what happened to you, you find the same pain racking your being. Why? It's what I said a few minutes ago, but let me say it again, talk a little further. We believe, this is so important you hear this, we believe that if we let go of the one who hurt us, I mean mentally, they're probably not around us now, but if we, we believe that if we let go of that one who hurt us, if we set them free in our mind, that somehow they would escape punishment. Of course, as I say, that's the strange idea that they're being punished because we hold them in our mind. That, that's this thing about that. It's as if we've got to keep the event alive in our mind in order to ensure our just revenge. You see, we want the books to be even. Revenge. That's it. That's where it's at. Revenge. Doesn't matter. With a person, if you get the root of bitterness, you'll look for revenge on every little tiny thing. So if they cut you off at the light, you'll chase them down the road to cut them off further down. Revenge. You've got to get it even. You say, you've got to get it even. The person who hurt you must be hurt at least as much as they hurt you. And then they've got to come begging for the restoration of our friendship. We always have that fantasy. It's amazing, you know, that bitterness is passed on from generation to generation. I, I, coming from Europe, some of the feuds between families go back for generations. I mean, there are... There's bitterness sown in a family back in the 1600s, and it's still alive today in the 21st century. Would you believe that? Well, you go to Europe, it's there. Why? <laughs> the truth is, anyone today forgets why they hate so-and-so. They forget why this family hates that family. They, they forget why this clan it is a sworn to fight to the death against that clan. They forget why it happened so many generations ago. But to give it up, they feel they would be betraying their family. And bitterness never stands alone. It has a family that comes with it. Wrath, says Paul. It's bitterness and then wrath. What's wrath? Wrath is explosive rage. It's violent rage. You know, when your face goes red and your voice gets louder and you hardly know what you're saying and you might use your fists along with it. That's wrath. Anger. What's anger? Anger's in the opposite direction. Anger is rage that goes in inside. It implodes and it smolders there for weeks and months or maybe years. And it will, like a volcano, it will spit out sometimes in sarcasm, bitter sarcasm, or hurtful actions, or undue criticism. And many, many times in deep depressions. Clamor, said Paul, is in the... What's clamor? 
very old English word, but it means uncontrolled temper, it means shouting, yelling, and interestingly, not necessarily at the person who hurt you, but at anybody who's in your way, and they wonder, what did I do? But you go through life like this. Slander, that, that means gossip, talking about people behind their back. Evil speaking is another word that's used in the New Testament. Words that are intended to bring hurt to another. And malice, it includes all of the above. It wants the person to be hurt because of what they've done and because of who they are. Through all of this, Paul, who is at this moment the vehicle by which the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, he says, put it all away. That is, tear it down so we can begin to build up this beautiful life of Christ. Because the last uh, five minutes of talking have been very ugly that I didn't even want to say. Now, get it out of the way so we can bring forth the beautiful life of Jesus. Put it away, says the scripture we read. Put it away. Now, the, the tense and the mood in which it's written in the original language, this, you, we can't say it in English except by a sound of voice. So this is what it literally means here. It means put it away now. Do not pray about it. Do it now. Do not say you will try. Do it. Put it away now. Okay, that, that's what that phrase means if you translate everything that goes along with it. It's a pretty violent expression. It, 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 it's only, I mean, stamp your, your foot, pound your fist. Did you hear me? He said, there's no room for discussion here. There's no saying, well, I'll go and pray about it. No, you won't. There's no praying about this. This is the very opposite of who Jesus is. Put it away. And in Colossians, it speaks of the same thing, only it expands on it a bit. And it talks about um, putting off or putting away and putting on. And these expressions actually are used of clothing. That is, if you came into the house and you had on a filthy, dirty jacket that was crawling in lice, someone would say, take that thing off and put it out. Okay, that's what I've just been talking about. It talks in terms, though I say, of clothing, as if you're wearing this vile, corrupt, rotten, clothing of bitterness and its family you're 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 where and Paul is saying what what's wrong with take it off and then the Colossian end of this is and put on it's the same thing that the father did to the prodigal son he took off those rags of filth from the far country and put on him the best robe and put on him the shoes and put on him the rings. It's the same idea, exactly the same. It's as if he's speaking about a, a wardrobe and he is saying what you're wearing. You can't wear it, not in Father's house. It's inconsistent with everything the Father is. Take it off throw it out the door and don't ever dare go and bring it back in. That's what he's saying. And it's a new life, you see. New life. It's being built into us by the Spirit. Don't, don't be condemned. You see, I, I don't know anybody who really knew really who and what had come into them when they came to Christ. I don't know how many, especially in today's world, who had the slightest idea that they were being transferred out of the domain of darkness into the very 
kingdom family of the dear Son of God. And that love, love, love is now the very foundation of our lives. No, we didn't know that. If you knew it, I wouldn't be here tonight. And if you just knew it, we wouldn't need the epistles. No, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. And he comes and he builds the new life into us by pointing the old and putting his light upon the old and says that's got to be dealt with. This that Paul has written in Ephesians 4 is a detailing of love one another as I have loved you. This is what it looks like. First of all, we get rid of and then we be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. But notice, these verses, well, last week, love one another as I has loved you. Then this week, that you be kind, you be gentle, you forgive each other just as Christ, you walk in love, you be imitators of God. It, it's, he is calling us to put off the bitterness and calling us to put on this new wardrobe of love, gentleness, kindness, tender-heartedness and forgiving, calling us to do it. You see, the grace of God and this message that Christ is in you is not a call to passivity in which we watch as Jesus just does this in us and we're sort of the, the puppets. No, he is saying you and I make an active response to who he is and all he has revealed in his sufferings and deaths and burial and resurrection and ascension and the giving of the Holy Spirit, you, me, he calls us to make a response. We have seen the love of God. We've received the love of God. We've received his forgiveness. We've understood that the foundation of the universe is love. Then he said, then act consistently. Make a response to that. The initiative of faith. But yeah, I can't live with this anymore. Not in the light of who he is. Not in the light of what I now see as truth. I, I can't live with this anymore. And so in dependence upon the Holy Spirit, we're not passive. We're very active. And we put away and we take to ourselves this new lifestyle through and in the Holy Spirit. You see this passivity has been a lot recently. I, I would go to a meeting and people would come and say I want you to lay hands on me so that I'll give up anger or whatever. Um, Sorry, that's not in the Bible. I certainly can pray for you, but you can't get somebody to lay your hands on you and zap it all away. Another person says, I, I, I'm, I, I've got this problem with envy and I want you to cast it out. <laughs> Sorry, you only cast out demons. When it comes to envy and all these other <clears throat> nasty words, it, it's you put it off in the strength of the Holy Spirit. So, and of course this is not legalism. This is not somebody bearing down on you and saying, you must give this up from God if God is going to accept you. No, no, no. This is, I'm not telling you to grit your teeth and summon some strength of your own to do something in order that God might like you and accept you. What I'm saying is, you are beloved. You are accepted.
accepted in and through Jesus. It's because I'm accepted. We make the choice to obey the command of the love that accepted us and in the strength of the Holy Spirit to start living consistently in harmony with this love who called us. The world reacts to life, reacts to life. I am caught on the ocean, caught in the currents, driven by the winds, and I say, I can't help it, I can't help it. In Christ Jesus, we are called to start living, which means acting, not reacting, acting out of who I am, this person in Christ. And I say again, we can do this because we are accepted, we've been included into the family of God. We are now partakers of the divine nature. The Holy Spirit is in you. I don't care if you were born again this afternoon. The Holy Spirit is in you and he's already beginning to work out this salvation. That's where he comes and says, be imitators of God. What a statement. Be imitators of God. But no, it doesn't stop there. It says, be imitators of God as beloved children. What a difference. You see, and some of you have heard this illustration before. I'm not apologizing. There are times when I hit on an illustration and you can't do any better. So I just keep repeating it. But it happened years ago when I was in Africa on a trip and I was taken deep into the jungle to this um, village and I was met there by the missionaries who made their home there and as I came out of the plane, little tiny Cessna, um, there, there the missionary missionaries, there was more than one of them, they were there to meet us along with the whole church of that village and they, they came to shake my hand and I was going down the line shaking hands with, with the people and at the end of the receiving line there stood a chimpanzee and it was dressed in the clothes that had been sent from somewhere in the US, you know those clothes we send to missionaries and here stood the chimpanzee, obviously had been through this before. It gave me an enormous toothy grin and put out its hand. And I shook the hand of the chimpanzee who was dressed like a missionary. And, and we then began to walk back toward where the missionaries lived. And we were talking. And behind us came the chimpanzee and it had its hands clasped behind its back and it was nodding as it came along looking every bit as if it was giving some input to the conversation taking place just in front. You know, what was the response of everybody to that chimp? Everybody howled with laughter. They said it, it's such an imitation of a human and, and the better his imitation became, the more the people laughed. I, I, I thought at the time, uh, that's rather tough on the chimpanzee. I mean, uh, he's doing a jolly good job here, looking pretty much like a human. And yet everybody laughs. Why? Because it doesn't matter how much. He tries to be like a human and how he perfects his imitation. It's very obvious he doesn't have human life. And therefore his imitations, though they're so good, become an object of laughter. I thought about that. I, I flew out of Africa that day, or that time rather, after that visit a and I flew into London Airport in England and uh, I was met there by my eldest daughter and some other people and the other people 
came to me in, in a congratulatory tone and they said your daughter gets more like you every day and I suddenly thought of the chimpanzee nobody congratulated anybody over the chimpanzee they just laughed and yet when my daughter her actions were becoming more and more like mine I along with her we were congratulated what's the difference she's one of the family she shares my life and therefore when my life in her begins to be made manifest it's a matter for congratulation do you see the difference and when a person who has not Christ living in them when a person merely is being religious and in that they try out of their own self their own flesh to act in a gospel way it's pathetic I mean it really is it's hollow it's as hollow as knocking on a church door it, it's it's you know there, there's no life there they're merely going through the actions and, and that phrase I mentioned last week that you find found on the back of cars you know you're doing random acts of kindness senseless acts of love yeah you see there's no foundation random just off the top of your head no reason for doing it senseless yeah because I don't know why I'm doing it but chimpanzees and if it wasn't so eternally tragic it would be the joke of the universe rather it causes God himself to weep in the face of Jesus Christ no we imitate God we put off the bitterness we put off all the family of bitterness to put on the gentleness and to put on the kindness and the forgiveness we imitate God himself because we're in the family because his life is within us we choose to put away bitterness because it's incompatible to be bitter considering who I am in Christ and that Christ is my life we put on forgiveness because of who we are in Christ you see then then why don't we forgive actually there's a lot of reasons we don't forgive they're all misunderstanding forgiveness let me run through a list quickly you see forgiveness okay we're talking about you and I when we will forgive a person forgiveness is not absolving that person's sins that that is I'm not pronouncing that their sin is pardoned I can't do that only God can do that that's between that person and God when I forgive a person it does not mean that I have pardoned them before God I have not absolved their sin hold that thought forgiveness is not surrendering to the person boy I hear this so many times if I forgive the person who hurt me it's not giving in to them to become their doormat it's not letting that person somehow win the truth is that considering the fact only a person in Christ can forgive in the sense we're talking forgiveness is for you to own the situation and to triumph in Christ and to enter into true freedom see to have unforgiveness or bitterness is to be under the control of the person that I'm bitter against I mean every remembrance and, and uh, I said we help in that but every remembrance brings the hurt back and tightens the chains of that person who hurt us 
around us. And what they did dictates our mood and our life and our limitation today. That sounds like the person with bitterness is still the prisoner of the person who hurt them. And to forgive them means you have released them. That is, you have taken ownership of the situation. You release them and you enter into true freedom. Think about that. Forgiveness is not betraying ourselves. You know how some of us were taught in some of our evangelical churches, you know, you never get upset, you know. So you put on a phony smile, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a custom made for these kind of Christians. And you, you, you got it down, you just brush aside all the pain you're feeling and you say, oh, forget about it. It was nothing. Let's not talk about it again. No. No, no, no. The Psalms, they're full of, of David and others who express their hurt and their pain. They don't betray themselves. Before God, they say, this is how I was hurt. This is the pain I'm feeling. The Holy Spirit obviously encourages that. The releasing of our feelings to the heart of God. And also, releasing the person who gave the hurt. Oh, there's something else. Forgiveness is not forgive and forget. Where on earth did that come from? Not the Bible. Forgive and forget? We're not talking about some holy amnesia that you forgive and then you just forget about it. It's just gone. I don't know where you are. I can't remember what. No, daft. Of course not. You can't forgive until you admit you've been hurt. And when you forgive, the poison is sucked out of the hurt by the Holy Spirit. But you don't forget that the event happened. Rather, the event now is where it should be. Not inside your head and destroying your spirit and body, but it's back there in history, the hour and the day when it happened, and that's it. And you remember it as an event, but it has no roots or poison that gets into your life today. It has no effect on the present. But yeah, you, you don't forgive and forget. You forgive, and the event now is placed on the timeline back there where it happened with no effect in the present maybe the biggest thing is forgiveness is not reconciliation reconciliation demands the coming together of two who before were thrown aside into separation and one person can't achieve that forgiveness is one thing reconciliation is quite another I'll tell you right now, there are persons that I have completely forgiven, but outside of a miracle that hasn't happened these many years, I don't think I'll be reconciled until we meet in the presence of Jesus. Because things are just the same as they were in that other person. Uh, you see, you can forgive a child molester, but you don't let him in your house to babysit your children. You follow me? You forgive that mother that abuses you emotionally, but then you don't go and visit with her every Wednesday so she can destroy your life for another six days. No, you forgive and you release them. Reconciliation is a totally other matter, a totally other series of messages. No. 
And so many people feel that if they forgave, they're now going to be buddy buddy with the person. No, no, no. That that demands a, sometimes a long history of miracle. I'm just talking about the portal. I'm talking about the doorway into this life. And we're talking about forgiveness. And as I've said, forgiveness means that you release the person. That's the meaning of the word. Forgiveness. Look up the Greek word, aphiemai. It means to release a person, to send them away. They're no longer under your care or responsibility. You've sent them away. Forgiveness is simply to release the person into the hands of the Father through Jesus Christ the Son and to do that in the enablement of the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to say, is that not simple? It is what Jesus did you remember on the cross he said father forgive them they know not what they do okay that's the historical account of what Jesus said what was going on inside of Jesus at that time you can read it in 1 Peter 2 21 through 24 let me read it to you Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. He who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Let's look at those words. Leaving an example. That goes back many 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 years to when I was at school before we had computers or anything like it we, we had a pen a and the teacher would write the alphabet in beautiful cursive writing and we would then copy sometimes we'd put paper over the top you could see through it and copy over other times we would copy underneath it and that's the exact meaning of this leaving an example. That Jesus, in the way he handled all the hurts of the cross, he left us an example that we, like little students copying the teacher, so we are called to copy Jesus. It's the only time in the scripture where we are instructed to use the sufferings of Jesus as an example to follow. The only time. So it goes on as if to reinforce that and says, so we follow in his steps. Like walking on the beach and putting your foot, footstep into the footprints of the one you're following. Same idea. And it speaks of Jesus being reviled, which means insulted and humiliated. It uses the word suffer, which means an abusive kind of suffering. Jesus was abused in every way a human can be. But then it says, he did not respond in kind. So when he was insulted, he did not return an insult. When he suffered, he did not return with a threat that I'll get even with you. Rather, it says he entrusted himself. And this is another massive word. It means to deliver over to someone. It means to take whatever it is and to commit it into the hands of another for their management and their keeping. This is a key to the whole passage. He is saying that as they spat at Jesus, as they punched his face, as they abused him physically and with words, he, and the word here is very specifically, he handed them over. He entrusted what was done to him into the hands of the Father, the righteous judge. 
he released it to the Father. All that stands behind his words, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. More than that stood behind them, but that is what we're looking at, this meaning of the word forgiveness. Jesus entered into the sin of mankind at its worst. And when mankind had done his worst and was doing his worst, through Jesus, Jesus and the Father celebrated that he released us from our debt, a debt that was beyond collection. He embraced us and said, your debt is paid in full. The Father forgives you. I forgive you. And the Holy Spirit brings you the forgiveness. When I forgive, I declare, in, in doing the act of forgiveness, I'm declaring that I, I agree and I cancel the debt that God has already cancelled. I'm siding with God in Christ and I am saying to this situation, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To this situation, let your kingdom come. Let your love rule. That in the strength of all that Jesus has accomplished, all that the Father wills, in the strength that his life is in me through the Holy Spirit, then I release this person. I'm no longer their judge. I'm no longer their executioner. I no longer seek revenge. I place the entire matter into the hands of my father. Stephen, as the stones rained down upon him, and Saul of Tarsus was in the act of organizing his stoning to death, his last words, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Then I have to say, to whose charge was his sin laid? I believe Stephen was saying, Lord Jesus, you've taken this sin, and I agree, and I release this man to you, that his sin be recognized as laid to your charge. You see, when I choose not to forgive, I am saying, uh, let my, my sins be forgiven through the blood of Jesus, but let your love and your grace stop right there. Do not cancel their sin. Let them pay for their sin. That's what we're saying. We're saying, do not forgive them. Do not bless them. Do not show any love or grace to that person. Leave that one to me. Leave them in my hands and I'll take care of them. That's what we're saying. Seeing forgiveness is very simply the exact opposite of that. It's recognizing in the light of what God has done in Christ that I take this person, I take how they hurt me, and I release them. I release them to you, Father, in and through Jesus Christ, for you to do with them what only you in your perfect wisdom know must be done. I release them. They're no longer in my hands. I no longer seek what I consider their just end. It's up to and over to you. Now, that, that's pretty heavy stuff that I've just said pretty heavy stuff when you really think about it you see when we say we couldn't forgive that person we didn't think that we were saying forgive me but don't forgive them we didn't think about that nor did we think about that I'm in your hands and I'm in your blessing and I'm in your love but leave that one to me we didn't think about that the elder brother if you read carefully what he was saying when he knew his younger brother was brought home and the father had forgiven him and received him the elder brother said he could no longer be part of that family couldn't he couldn't be part of the family 
where his brother was forgiven. Or to put it another way, he was saying, I cannot enjoy heaven unless my brother's in hell. My heaven is to know he's in hell. That's unforgiveness, you see. It's a pretty chaotic situation if I don't forgive. Because it's the beginning of everything else. No, and I hear me, because somebody asked last week, does love mean I've got to be hurt first and then I... No, no, no. No. Love is a grand adventure. Grand adventure that stretches out before you, but you're not even going to get to square one until you learn forgiveness. And it's not only about those things in the past but we're going to face this every day I mean how many times in a week do you either build a grudge against someone pass a judgment over someone or forgive them and release them and, and once you realize this it doesn't become some almighty moment it's just simply you release them go on your way knowing you you have placed them in Father's hand. And that's a potent act. It's not just a little shrug. You, you have set in motion a spiritual action where the Holy Spirit now will work in their life in cooperation with your releasing them. So, very quickly, and I'm through. Number one, tonight, before you go to bed, recognize that all of us we are responsible to put away all bitterness and we are responsible to forgive all who have hurt us even as we you and I have received forgiveness for our sins and live in the love of the Father so we're responsible to have lives that are consistent with the gospel you say, I don't feel like it. Of course you don't. If I felt like it, there'd be no need for me talking to you, right? I, no, of course, we're, we're not led by our feelings. <laughs> we're not governed by our feelings. Own your life. Christ lives in our central self, and we will to forgive. Look, if you if you felt like doing it, you, you would... And that's the essence of our problem. We don't feel like releasing these people. We don't feel like it. We, we are now actualizing the crucifixion of our flesh. And we're saying we recognize we, we were crucified with Christ. We were. And, and we are risen. And now we're going to act consistently, not by our feelings, but by who we are. We choose to do this. But then let's get very practical. Take time. Sit down, preferably alone somewhere, and write down the names of the people who hurt you. Write down the names and put beside what they did to you. Even if they're now dead, because they're very much alive in your head. Write in that sense what they owe you, how they hurt you. And then very deliberately, with intelligent intention, knowing what you are doing, you declare them released. You declare this person released. You declare that through Jesus, you acknowledge the debt is canceled. and you release them to the Father. Name them and say, Father, I release them to you. And then scratch out their name and what they owe. And burn it, maybe. Or trash it. Or do something with it that it's gone. And the old thoughts will return. They'll come trying to sneak in. And at that moment, stop. And if it's a 
good place, be violent about it, and declare that person has been released to the Father. They no longer live in your brain nor inhabit your heart. They are released to the Father along with all that they did, and therefore you have no discussion in your brain about them. It's the beginning of the life of Christ being worked out in your life and begin each day looking with love, sending God's love and hope to every person you meet with the expectancy of discovering God's love at work in people around you. Or shall I say, expect that the Holy Spirit is working in them too to will and to do of His own good pleasure. One thing that I should have said earlier and I forgot to say it. So let me say it now. If you are in a situation where your life is in danger, where someone is abusing you, humiliating you physically, emotionally, get out. It is not judging the person to get out. It is acting with all the sense that God has given you, but acting as God's beloved, the one who is worth the world to Him. And for you to stay in an abusive situation is not what this is about. You can forgive the person, but from a distance. And remember what I said about reconciliation. You forgive but reconciliation doesn't mean you invite them back into your life. Rather, forgiveness doesn't mean you invite them back into your life. That's for something else. And I feel strongly I should say that. If you think you... I'll finish with this, because this really happened. I, I, I spoke with this person. They, they, because of what they'd been taught about forgiveness, they, they, they came to me and they, they looked terrified. They said every night they go to bed. Their husband had a loaded shotgun under their chin and his finger was on the trigger while he slept. And they said, I've been told I should submit to my husband and stay and let him do this. No. I told that lady not even to go home but go straight to the shelter for abused women or to a church that can shelter her. No. Then from a distance you can commit the person into the hands of God but you do not stay in an abusive situation. That's a parenthesis and I trust that doesn't make you forget everything I've said. And I'm sorry I've gone over time but I felt I had to finish this thought tonight in saying everything that I had prepared to do. And so I will open up the chat room for, yeah, for some sharing questions, but let's stay on subject. And I'm telling you now, I may be saying we'll deal with that later. Because I'm, you can only put down your question, but I'm preparing you. Um, this is a big subject. When I, when I respond to this putting off, my response feels like I am trying in my own strength and being a hypocrite. So is this a correct approach to admit I can't do it and say, Lord, live this through? Um, this, the, the act of putting off, it's, I, I know exactly what you're saying, Mark. Number one, I want you to know that. I know exactly what you're saying. I tried to cover it while I was saying it, that we, um, we, we know Christ is our life. And we know that ultimately Christ lives his life in us and through us. The temptation then is that we become passive, limp robots like gloves and we expect him to be the hand who makes us move. But Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I live. Then he said, yet not I, it is Christ who lives in me. 
And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And so I make these that the New Testament calls the obedience of faith. It's a true choice that I make, though I, I, I do so feeling my utter weakness. That's why it's called the obedience of faith, that I believe and expect that Christ himself will be my life, but I make the choice. And so I choose. I'm putting this off. This has no place in my life. It's inconsistent with who I am, and therefore I put it off. Lord Jesus, I put it off in your strength, the Holy Spirit making that strength mine. And I walk out into life today to put on love and kindness and gentleness and tender-heartedness. And sometimes I've said, Lord, I hardly know what these words mean but I'm looking to you to show me the opportunity and live your life through me. And so we get this, I call it tandem. It's we're walking in step together. He is the life. I make the choice to let him be my life. And so we live. I live, yet not I. It's Christ who lives in me. Or what about in Philippians 4? where Paul says it very strongly, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so, yeah, we make the choice, but we do so in utter dependency upon Him. In the choice we make, it is obeying His Word, which that one command, which is being spelled out in great detail in the epistles, the one command, love one another as I have loved you. So by faith, by simple trust in Him. I say, okay, Lord, so that's going to be my life. And um, it's as we do it, and do it with words that come from heart, as best we know our heart, um, so it is so. I mean, my wife does not have enough love of human self to love me. I do not, certainly do not have enough human love to love her. And so we have taken our human love and said, it's, it's taken through the cross. And we now receive your love one for another. And um, I mean, that, that's a good beginning point in terms of a daily life. And, and it's the same when I look at those we work with, those that we come to every day. I am continually aware of my own self, I can do nothing, yet I'm doing it, believing his strength in me. Okay, I hope that helps, Mark. Um, okay. Can a person have bitterness against God? Yes, we can. It, it, sometimes it comes from false teaching. Actually, a lot of it does where we um, are taught that, that God does all the evil in the world and therefore we are bitter that if he's a God of love how could he do this how could he do that and of course the truth is he, he didn't do that um, the evil in the world comes from the evil one a and the evil deeds that people do who are wedded to the evil one it's it's not what God does the the weather um, is is it's a result uh, of the fall where, where the entire universe was thrown off kilter through the sin of man and, and so many people so many people are bitter against God believing that he he did these evil things and he didn't um, but there are times also when I, I'm, I'm in pain for whatever reason and I, I, I just feel, God, why don't you get me out of this or something like that. And then, then we hold resentment and um, it's perfectly okay. If you read through the Psalms, you will find that the boldness with which the people who wrote the Psalms, they talked to God and, and told God how they felt he wasn't listening and so on. Um, 
and, and to say it out and to be real with God instead of say words that you feel that you're supposed to say um, and to ask for his enlightenment and a revelation of his love and, and that that is is dealt with um, so um, kingdom what do you do if the person who has betrayed you is your spouse yes I can forgive but what sort of relationship is left only one that the Holy Spirit can build um, to forgive and of course with this one sentence and I'm not asking for any more but with this one sentence you know the nature of the betrayal and what the spouse has done in return upon the discovery of betrayal all of that plays in but the fact is if you receive the grace with which to forgive that is release them and their betrayal and then have the Holy Spirit build this love which is God love into your relationship um, I, I believe the impossible can happen um, sometimes the the nature of, of the betrayal and that's where I'm very limited in what I can say um, makes that almost impossible but we believe in the miracle love never fails that's divine love never fails and if the person has betrayed you and knows of and uh, has spoken the betrayal and asks for forgiveness and then it is for you to be the one who initiates the love that receives back and begins to start all over to rebuild a relationship I hope that helps but with the nature of what we're doing here in the chat it's very difficult to fully speak to that Pat a million thanks I've been struggling for years with a sister who has repeatedly been emotionally abusive holding bitterness toward her put me in a cage in the past yes Pat you release her and you do not allow her into your life to continue the emotional abuse um, you, you've, you heard what I said earlier that, that this is not reconciliation what we're talking about tonight is very specific it's forgiveness so I release the person to God and, and I follow them especially as a sister you, you follow them with prayer for the opening of their hearts and eyes knowing that it's an open ended you're not caging them but also you don't let that person willingly into your life on a regular basis to continue the abuse and um, that can be hard sometimes but I mean I, I know persons who have come into real life when they finally said to a father a mother a siblings and um, I'm sorry but every time I'm with you 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 say something abusive to me and you hurt me and so I think it's best that we we don't come together uh, until you, you can accept me just um, however you would say that to them um, but I, I see people who are beaten down beaten down beaten down by family members and that's not what forgiveness is about it's not what being a Christian is about it, it's living in, in the worthy person that you are the beloved person you are in Jesus Christ okay how does one get the strength to move on after one starts seeing the abuser as their savior how does one get the strength to move on after one starts seeing the abuser as their savior sorry I don't quite understand what that means but I can tell you this and we're going to pursue this next week so maybe I'll answer your question next week but next week the strength 
that those words there you wrote the strength and what Mark said my own strength that word strength it's in the New Testament it's the word dunamis and it's variously translated as power or strength um, it, it, it's always linked to the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is the strength of God and the strength of God is the Holy Spirit and so um, all the strength that we get to live and all the strength that we need to work out what we've been talking about tonight all of it is in the Holy Spirit and outside of the Holy Spirit you, you will not know strength and so um, I urge you as I've urged you week after week after week in various ways all of you it, it's a continual opening of your heart to the Holy Spirit um, to let him be your strength in whatever way you need him to be that strength but I think I'm gonna answer you next week okay LJF I'm so excited for the ones who have heard your teaching on forgiveness for the first time and I learned what forgiveness was I've experienced real freedom thank you for sharing that thank you and what you're referring to of course is when I gave so much teaching on this back in the 1980s and that was repeated then through CDs and tapes and if any of you are looking for what I've had no time to talk about tonight we have a two CD series called Unlocking Forgiveness and we have a six hour series on forgiveness which I gave sort of the, the final word and that's called Loose Him and Letting Go so a two tape or two CD it's two CD I'm sorry two CD uh, series Unlocking Forgiveness and then a six CD Loose Him and Letting Go and I think um, it, it's that teaching back there in the 80s um, and then on from there uh, that LJF's referring to so but thank you for sharing that because sometimes it needs somebody like you to say that to assure people that this is the pathway of freedom Um, hey Pat, you're back, I see there. Yeah, um, I discover she blocked me on Facebook. Maybe it's for the best. You bet it's the best. You don't invite someone into your life who is going to beat the living daylights out of you um, mentally and emotionally. Um, okay, Pat and Pat. I no longer live in a cage of bitterness but in freedom and God's love. Amen. And Pat, again, please tell me you have put your message tonight on CD. Um, well, as I just said, um, there's a lot of forgiveness teaching that I already did back in the 80s. But I'm pretty certain that the last two weeks and this week and probably next week will be put onto CD ultimately. Okay. Um, Are you ready? I've experienced much peace after forgiving my abusive father and many others, but had to let Ju Jesus do it through me and look at him with compassion. However, I don't spend a lot of time with him. Amen. I think that whole piece there reflects what I've been saying there, Brenda. I think I need more on the reconciliation part because we still live and work with people who often hurt us. We can hurt them without knowing. Yeah, um, I dealt with um, this, at least partially, as much as one can in response to that in another CD series called How to Live with Difficult People. Okay, how to live with difficult people. And um, so I, I, yeah, I, I probably, if we keep pursuing this week after week, um, I will get to something about reconciliation, but that is a much bigger 
subject, but um, I, I think the way things are going on, I've got to at least address it. Okay, Claude, are you familiar with his God to Blame by Greg Boyd? <laughs> we had a Bible school this weekend, I mean that's like two days ago, and somebody asked me the same question. So I have got to look for the works of Greg Boyd. Um, obviously, he's got something to tell me. There's so many people telling me I should. Okay, let's see. Yeah, Bob from Indy. The greatest moments of my relationship has always come when I'm honest with my God and my Savior. Yeah, and so many people are afraid to be honest. As if we can put on this soupy, silky religious front and use all the right words while we're feeling very definitely inside. Honesty, honesty, honesty. Walk in the light as he is in the light. It's okay. You see, it's safe. He loves you with an unlimited, unconditional love. Um, yeah, again, this is so true. When a person lives with abuse, it becomes their comfort zone. You better believe it. They don't want to leave, but once they find out how much God loves them and cares for them, they get the courage to leave. Amen, amen to that. And, and on this whole subject that we're sort of sliding into here, the kind of series that I did that covers all of it is Search for Self-Worth. We did that back in the 1980s and it still is one of our best sellers. And we have that on DVD, well, sort of. It's, it's not the best copy, it was a copy from a VHS, but we do have it on DVD and also of course on, on CD. And so it covers all of, all of this. Um, uh, well, you're asking for a series, explain reconciliation. Now, would you, would you all do me a favor? Let's get forgiveness straight before we think about reconciliation, because reconciliation is more than you. Reconciliation is the other party like the persons we've been speaking to, um, it, it, it's, it, if, if the abuser keeps coming into abuse, I can't be reconciled. I can forgive, but I can't be reconciled until they have a change. And so reconciliation um, is something that demands the other person, you have no control over them, and therefore all we do, which is some all, but all we do is forgive them and pray. And we've got a, all the prayers of the New Testament to pray um, toward reconciliation. But in some cases, the persons are in need of great spiritual direction and help before they would ever change in order for a reconciliation to take place. And um, I, I don't have a specific series that comes to mind. Um, the one that I gave to Brenda there, um, how to live with difficult people, is more as she was talking about your living, working with these people on a daily basis and uh, how do you live with them. And I see Nancy has just come in there um, with, with the saying, how to live love love difficult people. Okay. Um, we need to convert them to MP3. We are going like bats out of their hole converting everything we've got to MP3. Have you visited recently? We have got so many new ones on MP3. Um, John's brain is fried putting everything on MP3. So, um, yeah, that, that's, that's in process already and coming fast. Okay. 
Yeah, at one time you also had a small booklet on forgiveness and that you can purchase on our website as a download. We no longer sell it as a booklet, but you can download it. Um, you can buy it and download it from the Unconditional Love page. Um, Andrew Colony, I'm finding that as I do what you have said and act as if find myself with pride or anger at someone in the face of that begin to serve them by my mind catching up with my actions. Actually what I said about act as if you never get beyond that. That is something that you, you put into practice in all of this. Okay um, we've come to an end of this time and pretty obviously we could uh, go on uh, forever and ever but um, we'll come at it again next week and as I said those series that have been mentioned um, will help you in a lot of these areas and I believe that the Lord will bless you as you pursue this but let me say this again there's a lot of ways and questions that you might have when it comes to forgiveness but ultimately you'll never have any answer until you adopt this as your mode of life and begin forgiving all and then living in forgiveness. Then a lot of questions begin to be answered because you're now walking in the life of God. Okay, and again I see Nancy has come in with another Word document further down here. So um, keep on reading down because Nancy's done a lot of answering here. Okay. And now the blessing of God who is almighty love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that blessing rest upon you, enable you to forgive even as you have been forgiven, and to be beloved children in the family of the Father. So I bless you and send you on your way in the peace of God. Amen. And see you next week.